Okay, so now it's a very great pleasure to introduce Alexander Anders from Budapest, who's going to be talking about Neolithic burials in the Polga region in Eastern Hungary. Over to Good morning for everybody and uh, for everyone. And first, we, would we should like to say thank you to the session organizers, to Pani, Maria, and Juan for the invitation and for the opportunity uh, to present our lecture in this conference. About uh, 2,000 kilometers uh, away from here, in the northeastern part of the Carpathian Basin, more than 7,000 years ago, people had settled down in the region of Polgar. We don't know the exact size of the, exact size of the population, but some 340 burials have been uncovered on eight sites in the Polgar area in eastern Hungary, the dates of which fall between 5,500 and 4,500 uh, 4, uh, Cal BC. A part of these burials can be assigned to the Middle Neolithic linear band ceramic, another part to the Late Neolithic Tisza Herpaitius Heilum complex. The burials were not deposited in independent former cemeteries, all of them were settlement burials. Although for the first glimpse it doesn't really seem to be a high number, uh, the most relevant peculiarity of these burials is their very amount since previously such great numbers of burials were never found within a smaller region in the Great Plains. Summaries of the former excavated graves mention only 200 burials from the LBK and about 500 from the late Neolithic. Polgar Island is a less covered lux surface rising above the one-time fruit pane, covers some 60-70 quadrat kilometers and lies on the outskirts of Polgar. The microregion is outlined by the boundaries of the one-time natural paleogeographic conditions, and it was thus possible to reconstruct the sequence of human occupation and the changes in the microregion settlement patterns. From the foregoing, it's clear that barriers on and in Polgar and its vicinity almost immediately attract the attention of the European res research as well as they soon became source material for several international projects. Due to this large-scale international multidisciplinary research progress conducted in the recent years, bioarchaeological, I mean isotope, DNA, and pathological data on the analytic barriers of the Polga region have been considerably increased. However, these initiatives were are large European scale research programs overreaching thousands of years, so to say they focused on the big picture to the construction of which the graves of Polgar can only serve as mosaic ties. Therefore, neither do the obtained results overlap with our proposed field of research, nor is their distribution uniform. So the aim of our project, which has been started last December, is to get a better understanding of the life and death of these communities. Here we would like to introduce this project for the first time for a wider audience and present our very first results. The main goal of this project is to change the, so to say, author perspective and to seek answers uh, for such questions which are relevant from an inner point of view. The region is Polgar Island and the about 340 excavated barriers is there provide an excellent background for tracing those changes which may have taken place both in the life of communities and of individuals. Uh, we aim to collect equal quantities of data from each and every site in equal quality. As far as possible, we intend to fill the blank spaces left by previous research as well, since all of them will our results become comparable. And we have quite a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, these are the, our most relevant questions uh, and proposed research are the following. Are there any detectable changes in lifestyle between the various phases of ALP and late Neolithic uh, a period which covers almost 1,000 years. Are there any traceable 
differences or changes with regard to the life of individuals who were buried at co-temporary sites lying at a great distance from each other. Were there any differences between male and female food consumption? And if so, who had they been changed through space and time? What kind of role did weaning play in the life of community? Are there any detectable differences in space and time? Is there, and if so, what kind of correlation can be observed between the life A and the health condition of such individuals who were buried with valuable prestige uh, artifacts such as condylos, red, and red deer canines? Were there changes in health conditions through space and time? What kinds of traumatic lesions, contagious diseases can be traced? And on what kinds of individuals? We'll be able to find a proper explanation for the under and over representation of certain age groups on the basis of their differences in lifestyle. Are there any traceable differences between men and women with regard to the work they had performed, and are there any detectable differences through space and time? What kind of differences can be detected between the remains of children? Were there changes through space and time? Are any difference, for example, between the individuals buried respectively in the, in the single area settlement and in the tell settlement of Polgar Chersalom? Are there observable differences of correspondences at Polgar Chersalom between the individuals buried in the vicinity of a given building? What kind of personal life histories can be reconstructed in case of unconventional barriers? What kind of work was performed with, uh, by those men, each of whom uh, was buried with an anomalous obsidian nucleus in the cemetery of Polgar Ferencihat? What can we know about the girl buried in Polgar Chersalom with a necklace made of 80 uh, imitation of red deer canines, or about the older woman interred with uh, four and six pondius arm rings? What can be revealed about the life history of the young child buried with a 10 centimeter long spondylus bead? Were there any differences between the five individuals who got buried in one pit? Furthermore, were there differences between the lifestyles of the older woman buried without grave goods at Polga Chersalon with the other ones? <coughs> were there Artifacts found in the grave, such as pondylus beads and armoring stone axes, bone and antlet, or personal belongings. What kind of object history can be reconstructed on the basis of use where, and do they have any relation to the personal histories? Did the man buried in Chersalom indeed use Polish stone axes? Will be able to detect use where traces on these objects, or upper limb asymmetry in case of their owners? How red deer canine necklaces were assembled? All, are all the teeth used for ornaments coming from praise hunted at the same season? Does this season correspond to the season of death of the praise hunted for consumption? What kind of data can be obtained from the specification of the disarticulated human bones occurring in great numbers in settlement objects at every site according to bodily location, age group, sex, and their spatial distribution within the given site. So have you, we, ha, I think we have quite a lot of uh, interesting <laughs> questions. Um, uh, but these questions can only be answered with the aid of a, a complex approach. As applied individually, neither the traditional archaeological or anthropological methods, nor certain analytical techniques of bioarchaeology are adequate enough in themselves to solve these problems. The results will complement each other, and the emerging synergy uh, can shed light on the variation and the details of Neolithic way of life geared to individual person. So to sum up, the main goal of the project is, to, is the investigation of this uh, 340 Neolithic barriers unearthed in the Poga region with bioarchaeological and biosocial methods. Uh, and the methods we are trying to apply uh, archaeological, mic microarchaeological, anthropological, and bioarchaeological methods as well. The starting point of our methodology. Uh, our methodology are the approaches of, of uh, Marek Zvela, Bill Vedrovica, Alasdair Vitos, Lifeways, and uh, uh, Dusan Boric Lepensky Vir project. 
Our research strategy uh, comprises four correlating elements. The summary of the previous results, additional investigations which enable us to deal with equivalent data from various sites, applying new methods, and integrating and synthesizing the previews and the new results upon which we would be able to reconstruct uh, the micro histories of communities in the personal life of, of individuals. So we use physical anthropology and pathology, oral pathology, dental and buccal microbial analysis, analysis of anthesial changes using the method of Villot and Coimbra, and a more detailed paleodemocratic study of the series will be carried as well. We also intend to carry uh, isotope investigations to reconstruct the diet and uh, possible migration. Manufacturing marks and use were analysis of grave roots made from organic and non-organic materials, such as pondylus artifacts on antler and bone tools, and then red dye canines and polished and chipped stones as well. Provenient studies uh, uh, on lithics and spondylus artifacts and a quite a new passage of uh, searching the red deer canine cementum increments uh, uh, led by uh, Solange Rigaud. Um, and uh, last, last but not least, we apply the methods of archaeozoology and karyot radiocarbon measurements. And now let's see our first results. Uh, the man with the polystone axis. Uh, polystone axis seems to be the expression of maleness, not only in the late Neolithic community of the Polgar Jerusalem, but in the wider Balkan area, or so, they, so to say, in the, in the Carpe. Carpathian area, as uh, like uh, uh, introduced us uh, uh, some minutes ago. So, and according to the preliminary results of the analysis of anthesia changes led by Istvan Ratz, there are no direct correlation between upper arm alterations and Polish tools as grave goods in male graves in Polgar. And we can add. Uh, uh, that uh, the youngest individual who was buried with an ex was only four, six years old, uh, according to the right, so probably he was unable to use the ex as a tool. According to our interpretation, the axes can be considered as signs or symbols and not real tools. Um, and on the basis of the manufacturing marks and user analysis of red deer canine beads carried out by Jujana Tut, and the letters comparison with the archaeological data, we can summarize the following results. Males never worn imitation, but females had tried to wear real and imitation beads as well. Imitations were made of either bone or clay. The wear of red deer canines and their imitation represent a strong connection to the uh, Maturus age group. This phenomenon is strengthened by the fact that this age group is underrepresented in the graves and the singular higher settlements. You can see here, this is the, uh, this, uh, the sign of this uh, 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 overrepresentation. Red deer canines had high prestige value and their appearance is usually connected with other high prestige value items. This indicates that wearing these beads might have been a privilege of high ranking women. There was no strict rule how to wear these personal adornments. Maybe these changes were made individually and they expressed the self or the identity of their owner. And according to the C14 dates, wearing such kind of beads built in different chain had a long tradition at the Pogar Jerusalem settlement. According to different user and rejuvenation, certain parts suggest um, that these beads were used longer than the lifespan of one person. If we take a closer look at uh, on these beads and their use in the wider context of the late Neolithic period of the Carpathian Basin, <coughs> we can observe that Pogacu, Salom, and two nearby settlements uh, have a distinct position. We don't know why. And finally, uh, we were able to reconstruct the life story of a brave hunter, uh, or, uh, uh, but we, we will present uh, these results in, the, in an afternoon session. <laughs> so uh, please welcome, <laughs> and thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.